Good morning, King's Cross. Welcome to worship this morning. Hope you guys are all rested <laughs> with your losing an hour. Let's stand and worship together. Good morning, church. It's good to see you. I'm Scott Clifford, the lead's pastor here at King's Cross. And if you are like me, you are not letting coffee out of your hand this morning. A happy time change and on spring break. 
I think uh, that's bonus points all around. For those of you that are here or joining us online, we are so glad that you've chosen to spend part of your Sunday, part of your spring break here with us at King's Cross. There's just a few things I want to draw your attention to that are going on in the life of our church. Uh, a few dates and a, a few other little items. Uh, in terms of dates, two things. One, this coming Saturday, so next weekend on March 20th, will be our church spring work day. There'll be work both outside and inside. Uh, if you're uh, signed in and a part of KC Online, you can go and look at all of the different work we'll be doing. You can even volunteer for particular jobs, or if you just want to show up Saturday morning, we would love your help and would love to put you to work as we uh, kind of get our building and our physical space ready for all the ministry that's going to be happening this spring and summer. We'd love for you to be a part of that. I'll be here, and I, I hope you'll be able to come for a little while, too, on Saturday. Also, Sunday, March 28th, uh, we will have our first ever Discover King's Cross class, and this is really a, it's a one-time class that we will offer on a recurring basis, but the idea is that if you're relatively new here at King's Cross, if you want an opportunity to get to meet and interact with the staff, hear about our mission and vision, uh, about some of the things going on in the life of our church, we would love for you to come be a part of that. We would ask, though, that you please RSVP to that. You'll see there's a card on the back of uh, the row in front of you that you can scan a QR code or go to our social media page. You'll find a form where you can fill that out. So we'll have some uh, prepackaged snacks that we want to share with you, as well as child care. So if you'd like those things, we'd love for you to register so we can prepare uh, for you to be a part of that. But as I said before, we'll be offering that on a recurring basis. So if you can't make it on the 28th, then hopefully you can make the next one from there. One other thing I want to let you know about, uh, too, that is new is that uh, to my left and your right, kind of right underneath that exit sign, we have a brand new Say Yes board. And I would encourage you to go check it out after the service. Uh, it's an opportunity where if you are ready to say yes to serving in the life of the church, you can go and look at all of the various needs and opportunities right now to volunteer, to lead, to serve, and you can uh, fill out a card that just says, hey, I'm interested in learning more about this, talking to a ministry leader about that, and we would love to get you more information and potentially connect you to a place of service. You'll also find that there is an area for prayer requests, and so you can choose a colored piece of paper based on where you want that shared with, one color that goes just to staff to pray over, another that would be shared with the staff and our shepherding council, and so we would love for you to utilize that as well. Linda Bogert did a great job putting that together along with Cherie and the staff, and so uh, I would just encourage you to take a look. It's really beautiful and great. The last thing I want to say, too, uh, while you're here is just a word of thanks to those of you that continue to give faithfully to King's Cross and our ministry here. Your gifts um, mean so much and let so much of what we do happen. And so I am so grateful for that. If you are interested in uh, beginning to give and to support the life and work and ministry of King's Cross as we uh, seek together to embrace brokenness and champion wholeness in and through Jesus Christ, we'd love for you to do that. Uh, you can always send a gift through the mail to the church. They're giving boxes um, at each entrance. And then uh, you can always, too, give online, whether it's through your bank's online bill pay or through kcc.church slash give. You can set up both recurring gifts if you want to give as a part of your paycheck each uh, month or maybe a one-time gift if you want to give uh, from a tax refund or stimulus payment or um, just because you feel led to do it. We'd encourage you to do that. But please know that your gifts matter. They make a difference and they make who we are and what we do possible. I'm glad that you're here and a part of us this morning. I'm glad that you fought through the lack of sleep and that your path and our path have crossed this morning. Will you join me as we pray? God, for sunshine, for a spring breeze, for rain that brings life, we give thanks this morning. We give thanks for spring break, for our teachers, administrators, uh, school leaders that have worked so hard, so diligently this past year to love and serve and teach our children to invest themselves in our community. We give thanks for them. We pray that this week, uh, particularly for our families and for our teachers, will be one of rest and renewal, that they may be able to finish uh, the school year strong. For all those that are traveling and not able to be with us, we pray uh, your protection. We ask for your provision over them this week, that you may bring them back to us very soon. 
This morning, God, as we sit with your scripture, both your words to us from the Gospels and your words to us from Ecclesiastes, that we may be people that have the courage and the imagination and the capacity to hold, hold them in tension from the cynicism and skepticism, the doubt and struggle of the cynic to the hope the joy, the belief that the kingdom of God is real, that the hope of God is real, that the redemption and restoration and new creation is possible. May you meet us in this place, renew us, restore us, and continue to draw us closer to one another and to you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and sing. This morning as we get started, um, I just wanted to share just what I feel like God is teaching me in this season right now is um, how often I try to take control of things myself and how often I don't recognize um, when it was, it was God and it was not me. And this first song we're going to sing, the lyric says, I'm not enough unless you come. And this morning I just want us to really lean into that of what are some areas in your life that you feel like... Um, Things are going well because you're doing something. Because I know I'm super guilty of looking at areas and saying, things are going well because I did this, this, and this. But recognizing that, no, it was God. It wasn't me. That I can't do anything without him. Um, That I need to be in a state of almost just complete helplessness to be able to truly connect and have a relationship with God. To recognize that he is the only thing that allows anything to come to fruition. Right? And so this morning as we sing these lyrics, I just pray that you can you can hear that truth and that you can sing this out, that, that we are not enough, that without God, that this is just music, this is just noise, um, that we need him, we need him present in every area of our life and that there's nothing that we can do without him. Um, and so I just feel like that's something God's really been speaking to me and I don't know if that speaks to you this morning, but I just pray that you can just hear that truth um, as we sing these lyrics together. go back to the beginning I can't control what tomorrow will bring but I know here in the middle is the place where you promised to be I'm not enough you come when you meet me here again yes Lord cause all I want is all you are when you meet me here again As I walk now through the valley, let your love rise above every fear. Like the sun shaping the shadow in my weakness, your glory. Oh, you are, will you 
here. He is here in this place. through the desert you were with us you were with us you are here Lord. I want to sing that bridge again but I just want to speak into it for just a second I know I've sung that lyric so many times and I've, I've sang it as inviting the Lord into this room. And I fully believe that if we speak out, if we cry out to our God that he will meet us where we're at, he will come into this place. He is here, he is with us. But I think, I think that lyric also speaks into a physical location we are in our life and our journey. If we feel like we're walking through the desert right now, if we feel like we're just, we're just lost, that we don't know where God is, and we're trying to get back, but, but God is growing us. He's, he's doing something, and he is saying right now, he's saying that he is with us, that we are not forsaken, that we may feel lost, we may feel like we're walking in circles, but God is doing something big. He is trying to grow us. He's trying to strengthen us, and we're going to come out the other side stronger than we were when we went in. And so as we sing these lyrics, if that's you this morning, if you feel like you're in the desert this morning, just cry out to God. Just sing out in faith, knowing that He is with you, that you are not forsaken. Not even for a minute were you forsaken. That the Lord is here. And not for a minute was I forsaken. time, let's just declare. For I'm not enough unless you come. Will you meet me here again? Because 
together, God, this morning, God, I pray that we can just live into what we're singing. God, that we can just rely on you in every area of our life. God, that we can just build our lives on the firm foundation that is you. God, just continue to move in this place. Continue to work on us, to grow us, to pull us and draw us closer to you. And God, we just offer all this worship to you this morning. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Well, I'm glad you're here today for what is the second week of five in our series, The Cynic and the Savior, which is a conversation between Jesus, the Savior, the Gospels, and Koheleth, the author or um, the source material for uh, Ecclesiastes, the Cynic. And so the idea behind uh, this series is what would it look like for us to imagine a conversation between these two folks? Uh, Koheleth, who is himself the uh, pinnacle of success, himself as successful as or more so than a king of his time, sitting down at the end of his life or the end of his career with this young country carpenter named Jesus. And what would they be able to say to one another, both from the perspective of the cynic who speaks truth but speaks from a darker, harder place of life and from the perspective of the Savior, who speaks truth, but from a much larger, expansive horizon of what God is doing in the world. And so that's what we do each week in this series. We'll read a portion, as we will today, here in a minute, from Ecclesiastes, and then a portion from Jesus in the Gospels, in our case, from the Gospel of Mark this morning. So before we do that, though, there's just three things I want to remind you of about Ecclesiastes. If you didn't get a chance to be here last week, or perhaps uh, we covered a lot of ground and maybe uh, you're a little fuzzy on some of the details, let me encourage you to go back. You can find last week's message on Facebook or YouTube, but we did uh, some, uh, I think, good kind of preparatory work in trying to locate uh, where Ecclesiastes is in the Old Testament and what's going on there. But there's just three things I want to remind us of this morning about Ecclesiastes before we pick up the conversation between the cynic and the Savior. The first is that Ecclesiastes belongs to what is called the wisdom literature of the Old Testament, along with Proverbs and Job. It's both a uh, descriptive of its content, it's trying to communicate wisdom, as well as its genre, its form as wisdom literature. And we said for our purposes, when we talk about wisdom, this is what we mean, that wisdom is the pathway to human flourishing. Wisdom is one of those things we know it when we hear it, sometimes we know it when we see it, but what is it? Well, we say that wisdom is what leads us to flourishing as people, and that we would say specifically as believers that flourishing, abundant life is defined by God, and so wisdom is the pathway that leads us into the abundant life that God has for us, and so we'll wrestle with that. How does Ecclesiastes, this hard, difficult book, lead us into abundant life. That's part of the fun and the conversation for us. The second thing is that Ecclesiastes Koheleth, the teacher, the cynic, has sort of three main points of focus. And starting today and then for the next couple of weeks, we're going to look at one of those points of focus each time. There is, uh, in his perspective, the relentless march of time, the inevitability of death, 
and the randomness of life. And for him, wisdom is coming to terms with each of those three things. And so today we'll talk about the relentless march of time and what Jesus has to say to us about time in the kingdom of God. Then finally, there's one last uh, sort of term or idea that he uses that we need to keep in mind, which is in the Hebrew, the word hevel, or as we talked about last week, the word meaningless. It's used over 30 times in this relatively short book, but for him at the end of the day, all of life, because of the march of time, the inevitability of death, the randomness of life, is ultimately, he says, hevel, meaningless, meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Or perhaps in your translation, it's vapor. It's as if you were grasping after the wind. We could even say literally something like, everything is absurd. And so how, what are we to make of the fact that in the word of God, our very uh, scriptures, we have this perspective that says meaningless, meaningless, everything is meaningless. What I like to think and what I like to hope is that the Savior, if given the chance, would sit across from Koheleth to make room for this conversation, to honor that perspective and that experience, but to then say, meaninglessness is not the end. There's a path to abundant life. And let me tell you about it. So that's where we are this morning, and that's what we're going to be talking about, uh, the march of time. So if you have a copy of Scripture, let me invite you to turn. We are going to be in Ecclesiastes chapter 1. If you're trying to uh, get there and find your way there uh, in Scripture, you can open your Bible right to the middle. You'll be in Psalms. Go a little bit more to the right. You'll hit Proverbs, and then after Proverbs will be Ecclesiastes. So I'm going to read for us to help us imagine this, right? This will be the cynic's chair. This will be the Savior's chair, and we'll imagine together what is it like for them to have a conversation. I'm going to read for us this morning Ecclesiastes 1, 2 through 11. And this is what Koheleth the Cynic has to say. Everything is meaningless, says the teacher, completely meaningless. What do people get for all their hard work under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth never changes. The sun rises and the sun sets, then hurries around to rise again. The wind blows south and then turns north. Around and around it goes blowing in circles. Rivers run into the sea, but the sea is never full. Then the water returns again to rivers and flows out again to the sea. Everything is wearisome beyond description. No matter how much we see, we are never satisfied. No matter how much we hear, we are not content. History merely repeats itself. It has all been done before. Nothing under the sun is truly new. Sometimes people say, here is something new, but actually, it is old. Nothing is ever truly new. We don't remember what happened in the past, and in future generations, no one will remember what we are doing now. Well, good morning, right? What a way to start with that. We don't remember the past, he says, and we won't be remembered in the future. Time marches on. Push, 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 he says. Everything is meaningless. Everything is vapor. Time marches on regardless of what we do, regardless of who we are. And so in that sense, what we do and who we are is meaningless, he says. And when we think about that, there's perhaps a part of us that is afraid to admit some connection to what he says. That for many of us, particularly those of us with a few years under our belt, the words of Koheleth maybe strike a little closer to home than we would like. This sense that time is marching on despite our best efforts to the contrary despite a desire to make an impact, to make a difference, to slow things down, time marches on. Life continues, regardless of what we do. It's an interesting place for him to begin uh, this collection of wisdom, this path to flourishing. How is it that it begins by saying it's meaningless? Who we are and what we do is meaningless. 
I could imagine here this wise, successful old man sort of uh, perhaps somewhat um, patronizingly trying to explain this to Jesus, this country carpenter from Nazareth, right? Who, at least up until the beginning of his ministry, seemingly hadn't made much of himself in the world, right? So it reminded me of uh, this image I share with you. I have some, uh, some water here in this jug, right? Poured into this bowl for us. But it reminded me of uh, this idea, right? I think what Koheleth would say about our impact in the world is it's a bit like this bowl full of water, our day-to-day life, right? That what happens is our impact, right? Our imprint, our hand in the world comes in and pushes into the water. And throughout the day, right, we make these ripples, we make this impact, right? Our presence in the world is felt, but then at some point, as our hand steps away, right, the water goes back just as it was, as if our hand was never there to begin with. And there's a portion of us that at different stages of our life, we have those moments, right? Maybe when we graduate high school, we look back and say, do the freshmen even know who I am? Do they care? Will my teachers remember me? Or perhaps it's when our kids grow up and leave home. Did I make a difference? Did I make an impact? Am I still a parent? Do I still matter? Or perhaps for us it's when we retire from a job or sell our company and say, what was that all for? What did I actually do with my life, with my career? Did I make a difference? Did I make an impact? Because when we step away, right, and we take our hand out of that sphere of life, we look back in the water It's just as we left it. Meaningless, meaningless. Everything is meaningless. There's a part of us that thinks about that and says that and says, gosh, maybe this Koheleth guy is onto something, right? Maybe he's more than just a little grumpy. And there's a part of us that wonders, I think as Koheleth is ultimately wondering, do I matter? Does my presence matter? Would anyone miss me if I was gone? What have I done with my time? What have I done with my life? These are big, big questions. And I think that's part of the great wisdom of Ecclesiastes is it makes space for us in the word of God and in the journey as God's people to ask ourselves those questions. And it invites us to also come to terms with the fact that for many of us, the passage of time can be painful. That for some of us, getting old, finding that our bodies are letting us down, our minds are not as sharp as they used to be, is an incredibly difficult reality to be reconciled to. For some of us too, it's the end of a stage of life as a parent or career or perhaps as a Uh, athlete, right? That for all of us, even the professionals, a time comes when we have to stop playing the game. Who are we if we aren't on the field anymore? These questions are critical. They are soul level to us. And I think the one other thing that his focus on the passage of time does for us is it invites us to consider what do we make of those seasons of life where we feel like time has been wasted? Do you have those seasons of life? That maybe you look back and you say, oh my goodness, I had this amazing opportunity and I squandered it, right? Maybe for you it was uh, college, right? You had this great opportunity, um, maybe to play sports or you had a scholarship and you didn't take it seriously enough and you lost the opportunity. The scholarship went away, you got kicked off the team, you missed that opportunity. Maybe for you it was pursuing a career uh, for whatever reason, good or bad, caused you to miss those critical years of being a parent. And you look back and say, time marched on 
without me. I lost a season. I lost this period of time. It could be any number of things for us. One of those difficult seasons of life for me, you all know part of our story, Joy and I struggled with infertility for several years, right? And it's difficult to look back on that time and say, what was the good of that time? It feels like nothing more than a time of loss or pain, right? Time marched on without us and brought nothing but disappointment. What is there for us in that? How does our faith meet us in that, right? That is, I think, a large portion of what Koheleth is trying to get us to consider, to have the bravery, to have the courage to face those seasons of life, those points in time that we feel left behind, to ask those hard questions, to say, does my presence matter, or am I just moving the water around until the next person comes behind me? If you haven't asked those questions yet, that's okay. I'd be willing to bet all the money in my pockets against all the money in your pockets that you will at some point. But the good news for us this morning is that meaninglessness is not the end of the story. That our Savior himself speaks directly to the passage of time, to the role that time plays in the kingdom of God, and to the hope that we as believers have in the resurrection of time. If you have that copy of Scripture, keep your finger there in Ecclesiastes 1 and turn with me to the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, excuse me, Mark chapter 4. Travel with me here. So in Mark chapter 4, we are early, relatively early in Jesus' ministry. And I like to envision that Jesus' response to Sorry. Oh, there we go. Throwing my mic around that in Mark chapter 4, we come across Jesus speaking in parables. And this particular parable is only shared in Mark's gospel. The only place it appears, the only place that it's captured and remembered is here in Mark chapter 4. But as I think about this parable, I, can, I cannot help but think of Jesus sitting with Koheleth with a cynic, with someone that says it's all meaningless. I look back at all that I've done and it doesn't really matter that I have forgotten those that came before me and I'm going to be forgotten by those who came after me. There's nothing new. There's no way for me to contribute. There's no way for me to leave an impact that will truly last. In fact, time has simply marched on. It will march on without me when I'm gone, and it's marched on even while I am here. That there are parts and seasons and times of my life when I can't help but look around and say, it's all meaningless. And I think it's that very person that Jesus has in mind when he shares this parable. Let me read for us Mark chapter 4, verses 26 to 29. Jesus also said, The kingdom of God is like a farmer who scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, while he's asleep or awake, the seed sprouts and grows. But he does not understand how it happens. The earth produces the crops on its own. First a leaf blade pushes through, then the heads of wheat are formed, and finally the grain ripens. And as soon as the grain is ready, the farmer comes and harvests it with a sickle, for the harvest time has come. Now, for those of us who maybe don't have the privilege of uh, carrying a sickle with us to work every day, this agricultural metaphor or parable may seem a bit fuzzy at first, right? It's not very long, but uh, there's a few important things going on here. 
Don't miss the very fact that Jesus tells us from the beginning what he is talking about in verse 26. We can almost imagine him, right? Listening gently, openly, warmly with the cynic who says, Jesus, this whole thing is meaningless. What's the point of it all? What have I done with my life? And Jesus, after listening patiently and kindly, leans back and says, let me tell you a story. The kingdom of God, the rule and reign of God, the restored world that God is working to bring about is like this, he says. It's like a farmer who scatters seed on the ground night and day, asleep or awake, the seed sprouts and grows. But the farmer doesn't understand how. The earth produces the crops on its own. What Jesus is beginning to say here is that the kingdom of God, the rule and reign of God, is not like the farmer, but like the earth. That while you and I are the farmer who scatters seed, who live our lives, who have successes and failures, who do our best to put something meaningful and good out in the world, that in the kingdom of God, we must keep in mind that God and the kingdom is itself an active agent in the world. That the redemption of God and the work of God doesn't come about just because you and I decide to do it. But that the kingdom of God is a place that takes what we give to it and brings life out of it. And our job is simply to offer something to the ground, to offer something to the Lord, to put something into the kingdom. And if we can do that, when we do that, the kingdom of God, what does it say, brings about something completely on its own. If we could go back and read it in the original language, it says that the earth produces the crops on its own. A Greek word, automate, where we get the word automatic from. That completely on its own, without the help of anyone or anything else, the earth is at work. The kingdom of God is at work. And so when you and I look back, When we say, oh my goodness, what did I do with those set of decisions? What did I do with that decade of my life? What did I do when I look back and realize I have been chasing after the wrong things? Jesus looks at us and says, fear not. Because in the kingdom of God, time is never wasted. In the kingdom of God, time is never wasted. That there is nothing beyond the life-giving, redemptive power of Jesus. If only, if only, if only, we have the courage to commend something of ourselves into the earth and into the kingdom. It's interesting, as I said earlier, that this is the only time, the only uh, time that this parable appears in the four Gospels is here in Mark's Gospel. But I think that makes sense. At least it makes sense to me. Because if we were to go back to Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, the very first words of Jesus in the Gospels, what does he say? That the time has been fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe. That for Mark, all of the gospel can be summed up how and that the time has been fulfilled. That it's not this vision of time, something that is our enemy, something that is neutral to us or apathetic to us, that somehow time is uh, something we must resist or fight against, that time is nothing but a source of pain and grief that yesterday is always better than today and yesterday will certainly be better than tomorrow? No. He says that the gospel, the good news, is that time has come in fullness. 
through the kingdom of God. When we look back on those places where we feel like we have wasted time, or time has been wasted on us, it's easy to respond in one of two ways. As we look at that from a place of sorrow, a place of grief, a place of anxiety, often, if we aren't careful, we choose to respond one of two ways. Either first with apathy, we reject it. We said, I can't go back to that time. I can't deal with it. I can't think about it. I can't engage it. I have to cut myself off from it. Or we choose to engage it with this frenzy of activity. That we think to ourselves, well, if I just work hard enough, I can make up for those mistakes. If I just work twice as much, if I just do twice as much, then I can redeem the time. But Jesus says, neither of those is what you were meant to do. You cannot, you must not, Cut yourself off from that, from the march of time, which is true, from the pain of time, which is true. But you also cannot and must not believe that you are the master of time, that you are the savior of time, that you are the redeemer of time. Neither of those, Jesus says, are good options. But rather, he comes to us and says, instead of resisting time, instead of controlling time, why don't you surrender to time? Because, he says, the kingdom of God is like a farmer who scatters seed on the ground. That after he has given something of himself, some fraction of his crop, into the earth, this job is done. The earth takes over and begins to work, begins to protect, begins to nurture and to cultivate. And the earth then does this amazing thing. It takes this seed that has been given to it and slowly, ever so slowly, it begins to bring forth life. ever so slowly. It sprouts and grows. First a leaf blade pushes through, then the head of wheat, and finally it ripens so that it's ready for the farmer to come again and to return to his work and harvest it. What I think Jesus would say to the cynic, what I think Jesus would say to us is that you're right. Time will march on. You aren't the first and you won't be the last. But it doesn't mean that this moment doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that your life doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that that time was wasted. But rather, if you and I can look to our past and even to our present, and say, God, I choose to give this over to you. I choose to stop believing that I can make the seed grow on my own, that I can fix what has happened in the past, that I can make up for what I've done wrong, but rather I return it to you. I give it over to the kingdom. I relinquish it. I surrender it to you. Then the kingdom of God is like the earth that can bring forth life from anything we give it. That is the good news of the gospel for us. So as you think back about your time, about the seasons of life that perhaps you regret or you grieve, perhaps the seasons of life that you miss, and wish back, the ones that rob you of the present, that want to steal away your future. The good news of the gospel 
is that nothing is beyond the redemption of God. That yes, there are parts of our life, there are decisions that we make that are not what God would have intended. They're not what God would have wanted for us. But that doesn't mean that if we can't in the present gather them and give them, then we might be able to find new life through them. As we get ready to return to worship here in a minute, let me just... uh, Leave you with this. Keep your finger there and mark, but uh, turn with me to the very end of the very end. Revelation 21. Let me just read for you the first few verses there. John speaking here says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, look, I am making everything new. And then he said to me, write this down for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. The one sitting on the throne said, look, I am making everything new. For what I tell you is trustworthy and true. If you hear nothing else this morning, hear this. That the kingdom of God is a place where everything can be made new. That there is no decision that you've made, no mistake, no mistake that, (laughs) that you have done and lived with, no place of apathy, no years that were wasted, that cannot be made new that cannot be restored, that God in God's goodness and mercy cannot bring forth life from. The work for you and me is to have the courage and the bravery to surrender it to God, to use the language of the funeral, to commend it to the earth. say, God, I give you back that decade. I give you back those mistakes. I give you back those failures with the full hope that you and you alone, God, in your kingdom may bring forth life. And that first leaf and then a stalk and then a grain in its full ripeness will be ready for me to come back and harvest into a good crop of new life. As we get ready to go this week, I'm going to invite our worship team back up, and there's a few few things I want to offer you about how we might be able to do this. That this isn't a one-and-done kind of thing. The very nature of it is what? That it takes a long time for something good to grow. I wish there was something I could say or something I could have you do that would make it all better right away. But God's redemptive work, as is true of all of God's work, moves at its own pace and its own time. But the promise of God and the promise to God's people is that the work will always get done. And so here are a couple of questions for you to think about this week. About what does it mean for us to be redeeming the time? What does it mean for us to truly believe that in the kingdom of God, time is never wasted? This week, let me encourage you to ask yourself, what portion of my life or part of my past 
needs to be buried and surrendered to the redemptive work of God and the kingdom. Is it a season of your marriage? Is it a time of your life with your kids? Is it a a portion of your life where you've run from what you felt like God was calling you to do or to be? What part of your present or element of your past needs to be commended, relinquished, surrendered to God and God's kingdom? And then let me challenge you to do a couple of things this week. The way I read and hear Jesus' words that the farmer, you and I, have two jobs. We offer the seed and we stand ready for the harvest. That the earth, completely on its own, will bring about the life and redemption that God promises. So our job, your job and mine, is surrender. So let me encourage you this week to find one way to bury this one part of your life. And you can do it any number of ways. If you're tactile, if you're visual, get a shoebox and dig a hole. Bury something in the earth this week. Commend something to God's good creation. It could be a photo, it could be a name tag. It could be a piece of paper. Bury it. Burn it. Do something to signal to yourself and to God that I give something to you. I'm not going to disconnect from it. I'm not going to be apathetic. I'm not going to run from it anymore. I'm not going to numb out to it. But I'm not going to overwork myself trying to make up for it either. I commend it to you, God. I give it to you, God. Say a prayer. Write it down. And then the hard work of partnering with God's redemption begins. If you have that time or that place or that part of your life where you feel like time has passed you by, where time has been wasted, seek help and seek hope. It's not lost on me that in order for a seed to grow, it must be fully buried. It must be consumed on all sides by the earth, that God's work when done best isn't just from a brief contact. A seed won't really grow if you just lay it on top of the dirt. You've got to put it deep in the earth, surround it, nurture it, protect it. So if you're a person that's struggling with the loss of time and the march of time, seek help and hope. God uses all sorts of people and pathways to bring about redemption. Meet with a pastor, go see a counselor, call a trusted friend. Don't do this on your own. Commend it to the kingdom. And then let the people of God surround you and support you as God works to bring about the promise of new life. As we go this week, may we be people of the kingdom, people that believe that in God and through God, time is never wasted. New life is possible and all things may be made new. Let's stand together and sing.
sing, I surrender. Oh, I surrender. I surrender. Oh, I surrender. I surrender. Yeah. Take control. Lord, take control. I trust you. I'm letting go. I'm letting go just to give you.
I think it's Jesus, the good shepherd, would sit with the cynic. I think you'd be able to say to him, you know, you're not wrong. Time will march on. Things good and bad will happen. There will be parts that you grieve, parts that you long for. But that doesn't mean it's meaningless. It doesn't mean that it doesn't have a place. It doesn't mean that life is impossible. The good news of the kingdom is that it is a place where time is not wasted and where the resurrection of time is possible. That God grieves with us in our pain, in our loss, in our mistakes. But a gospel of a Savior who brings life out of death, what better image for us than to realize that the Savior can come back into our life, back into our past and even into our present and say, where you thought there was death, there is the promise of new life. That is what this is all about. If you want to know more about who this Jesus is, what this kingdom of God is all about, come find me and let's talk about it. If you're ready to take that next step and doing the work and inviting God in to address the hurt and the heartache from your past. If you need help finding community or uh, meeting with a pastor, finding a counselor, any of those things, come find me. I would love nothing more than to help be a partner with you on that journey. As you get ready to go this week, brothers and sisters, may you go hearing these words from Paul in Romans Chapter 6, verse 4. Have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death also? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. May you go this week, brothers and sisters, confident in the love of the Savior and the promise of new life. Go in grace, go in peace. Amen.